to uh, turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, our God in heaven, remember us as we meet in your holy presence. Come down to us in all grace and mercy and cause this day your face to shine upon us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read the words of a hymn, 111. Jesus, these eyes have never seen that radiant form of thine. The veil of sense harks, hangs dark between thy blessed face and mine. I see thee not, I hear thee not, yet art thou oft with me, and earth hath ne'er so dear a spot as where I meet with thee. Yet though I have not seen and still must rest in faith alone, I love thee, dearest Lord, and will unseen, but not unknown. When death these mortal eyes shall seal, and still this throbbing heart, the rending veil shall thee reveal, all glorious as thou art. Well, we're back to the children's talk there this morning, and we're thinking about the books of the Bible. And we've talked about Genesis, and we've talked about Exodus, and all the way down um, right through to the book of Chronicles. We need a little bit of help there. Some seats there. That'll be okay. That's good. Good, well done, everybody. Yeah, so we've been talking about these different books of the Bible, and we come all the way down to the book of Chronicles. We jumped over. We went into the book of Ezra. Ezra was a man who loved God's word, and he brought God's word to the people. And then we came to Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, he wasn't a preacher, but he was very anxious that God's people did you know, things in God's way. And do you remember that he came all the way back to Jerusalem and he helped them to build the walls and they built the walls how many days? No, no, no. Your daddy's shaking his head. Good try. Good try. Anybody know? 52. 52. Well, it was days and nights because they did a lot of the work by night. But it was 52 days and nights they built the walls around Jerusalem. And then last week we talked about the wonderful story of Esther. Tricky one to talk about because quite a few chapters and really you've got to deal with Esther in one go. Esther, who was she? Well, she was a Jewish girl. She had an uncle. His name was Mordecai. She lived in a strange land. Remember the king of the land? His name was Xerxes. He fell out with his wife. What was his wife's name? Anybody remember that one? Mm. You see, we lost the children's talk last week when we were online, so oh dear. Mm, Vashti. Vashti, she was called. They fell out. The king got rid of the queen. Wow. And Esther became the queen. But there was a wicked man. His name was Haman. And he wanted to kill the Jews. And he wanted to kill Mordecai. Esther was the lady who prayed. She got all the people to pray. And she prayed, and she went into the, to the king, and she told the king all about it. And the Jews were saved, and Haman died. Remember? Wonderful story. This morning, I want to come on to the story of Job. Job. Um, Job was a man who loved God. Let's start there. His book is quite a long book, 42 chapters, all right? There's a man who is supposed to have preached on the book of Job for 20 years. How old are you, Samuel? Nine. Nine. So by the time we get to the end of this, you could be 29, hey? Imagine that, 20 years. Anyway, there we are, 20 years, and... Uh, Job loved God, all right? We've got to start there. He loved God. He had a big family. He had seven sons and three daughters. And we don't really know what his sons and daughters thought about God, but Job loved God. 
And when he got up every day, he would turn to God in prayer. And he would pray about the family because he loved them. And I'm sure that he wanted that they would know God and walk with God. Just as your mummy and daddy want you to know God and to walk with God. And I'm sure that they pray that prayer. That whoever you are here this morning, you would know God, that you would love God. Well, Job prayed for his children. He was very worried in case when they got a get-together, you know, a bit of a party. You know what parties are like. You know, got together for a bit of a party that people could do things that they shouldn't do and say things that they shouldn't say. And he was a bit anxious about that, but he loved the Lord and he used to turn to God. God loved Job. And he thought a great deal of Job. He really did. But he wanted to test Job. Now, anybody had tests in school this week? I know somebody's had tests in school this week. Yes? Hands up. Had a test this week? I think so, and Daniel has. And he was only there for half the week, so I, I don't know. There we are. Was it okay, Daniel? The test was all right. Thomas, any tests this week? No. All right, okay. That's good. Well, um, God wanted to test Job. Do you like tests? Have you ever tested in... Sarah, have you ever tested in school? Do you like it? You do. You don't mind. Do you have a word test on a Friday, do you? Friday. Mm -hmm. Have to study on a Thursday night. Work hard. Be ready for Friday morning. Well, not everybody likes tests, you know. And maybe mummies and daddies here don't like tests either. You know, something that we don't look forward to. But God was going to test Job. And it was all out of love. It was out of love. Satan, the devil, was around. And Satan doesn't do things out of love. He does things out of hatred. He hates us. He hates God's people. He hates God. And he doesn't do things out of love. And he wanted to get in there and cause trouble. Anyway, some pretty awful things happened, really. And they all happened on the same day and around the same time. Imagine that. First of all, there was news that some wicked men had come and they'd taken a whole pile of Job's animals. Then there was news that there'd been a, a terrible storm. It sounds like a storm, the way the Bible describes it. And there'd been lightning and, oh, there'd been some terrible deaths. Then there were some more wicked men, and they'd come and stolen Job's sheep. This wasn't a good day, was it? And then there was a, a terrible wind. Now, what might, what might happen if there was a terrible wind? It was a really blowy wind, a terrible wind. What might happen if there was a terrible wind? Hmm? Anybody got any answers for me? Yes! A tornado. Is that what you mean? Yeah? What, what sort of shape does a tornado make, Samuel? Like a, like a fun... Yeah, sometimes it takes people straight up, doesn't it? That's right. Charlie, tornado. Have you seen those on TV? Yeah. Yeah? Scary? Yeah. What if a tornado hit your house, Charlie? What do you think would happen? It would come to... Oh, it wouldn't stay up? No? Your dad's looking very worried now. You know, it would all come to bits, do you think? Well, pretty, pretty scary. Actually, Job's children died in this wind, tornado, whatever it was. And Job was left. He'd lost his animals. He'd lost his sheep. He'd lost his servants. He'd lost his children. Would you be happy? Samuel, would you be happy? You've lost all those things. Would you be happy? No, you wouldn't be happy, would you? You wouldn't be happy. Daniel, would you be happy? What would you do? Would you, would you cry? I think we might all cry. I don't know about you. I think I'd cry. Eh? I think we'd cry, wouldn't we? You know what Job said? 
Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. That's what he said. It's amazing, those words. Amazing. Naked, he said. I came, and naked I'll, I'll go. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God gives, God takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You see, he really loved God. He really trusted God. Well, I don't know how long went by, but God was going to test Job a little bit further. And Satan was there, and he didn't love Job, and he doesn't love God. And he wanted to do wicked things. And a terrible, we don't really know what it was, okay? But a terrible something came on Job, and he had these big boils. What does a boil look like, Sarah? Do you know what a boil looks like? No? Oh, Samuel knows. like a big massive oh is that what you do with them you do you like popping them do you there's people that pop these things on television can you imagine that hmm? you know and they show you all the gunge coming out oh dear hey i don't know about that well anyway poor old um job had these things all up and down him and he he got a bit of pottery and he he was trying to scrape these things off His wife, I don't know what his wife was like, but his wife said, what are you doing, she says. Why don't you just curse God? Be angry with God. And die. But Joe wouldn't do that. You see, he loved God. He loved God. And I want to talk just for a second or two about what it means to love God. And we can say different things about loving God. But loving God means trusting God. Loving God means believing God. Loving God means taking God's word seriously. Believing God. Trusting him. Boys and girls, God loves us and God wants us to love him. And we love him when we trust him. We love him when we believe him. Even when it's really, really hard to believe him. We love him when we believe him. We love him when we believe his word. And we do what his word says. Even though our friends say, you're not going to do that, are you? You're not going to pay any attention to the Bible, are you? We say, yes, I am, because I love God, and I love his word. That's what Job did. He loved God. We'll think a bit more about Job, because it's a big story. But he loved God. We need to know God. We need to love God, too. So remember the story, or at least the start of the story, of Job, and God willing, we'll come back to that next week. We're going to read God's word this morning as we find it in the book of Titus and in chapter 3. The book of Titus and in chapter 3. And these words. Let us hear God's word. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Saviour, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, 
whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. When I send Artemis to you, or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Send Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. And we thank God for the reading of his holy word. And we will come back to that uh, very shortly, but we're going to turn to God now in prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this beautiful morning. And we've had a few beautiful mornings this week, and we do rejoice at these wonderful days, the splendid weather, to be able to enjoy all that you have made. We worship you and we adore you, O God, for you have made all good things around us. And we're reminded in the words of the hymn writer, all good things around us are sent from heaven above, then thank the Lord, oh thank the Lord, for all his love. We do confess to you, O God, that these bright and sunny days put a spring in our step and they enable us to be more easily thankful, but we want to praise you and we want to bless you for your wonderful love. We thank you for the greatest demonstration of your love in that God sent into this world his only son to be our saviour, that we might be forgiven and pardoned for our sin. We've heard about Job there this morning and how that Job thought it so important and necessary to pray on behalf of his children, lest that they had sinned against you. And, O God, we need to pray to you, for there's no doubt that we have sinned against you. We pray that you'd cleanse us from our many sins and help us, we pray, that anew and afresh we may see our need of the Lord Jesus Christ and that we may rest and trust in him. We thank you for this one, our wonderful saviour and friend. And we thank you that he died there on the cross at Calvary because of sins, all ours, all our wrongdoings, all our guilt, all our sin and shame. We thank you that he is the one that took our sin upon himself. We pray that you'd help us to rejoice in the Saviour day by day and to know, O oh God, the enormity of the price that has been paid and to feel day by day the great indebtedness that is ours. How indebted we are, O oh God. Help us to live as those who know how much has been done for them. And help us that we may love him who first loved us. We do want to pray this morning for all in need. We rejoice, O oh God, that we can be gathered here, but we realize that some may not be so well. Others have situations in their lives. Others, O oh God, this morning are mourning, and we pray for each and every one in their need and in their trouble. We thank you that you truly care for us. And we can seek, O oh God, to care for one another. But how much you care for us. And you never fail in caring. You never forget. You never overlook. You're never unmindful of us. You're moved. You're touched with the feeling of our infirmity. And we're reminded that there's that uh, remembrance of the Godhead that we are but dust. 
Father, that brings us so much comfort this morning to know that you know all and about us and that we have a Savior who is there at your right hand. Whoever lives, we're told to intercede upon our behalf. We thank you for him and we thank you that we're precious to you this morning. Help us, Lord, we pray that we may know something of the wonder of that love and that we may be caused in our lives day by day to love him who first loved us. Draw near to us, we pray. Help us in the many situations of life. Help especially, we pray, our children. We thank you so much for them. They're very, very precious to us, oh God. And we want especially to remember them in school or wherever it is that they're studying at the moment, recognizing that they may feel concerns, they may be worried about that, recognizing too, Heavenly Father, that there are folk going out to work and in different places and stations in life, and that they too may feel something of the worry. We pray that you would bless and encourage each one. And we pray, Lord, that you'd help us, that we would be enabled in difficult days to be strong, to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We pray for our nation, and we seem to be at a very difficult station once and again. And we pray for those who have rule over us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give them great wisdom, not from their own hearts, but from above. Give them wisdom, O oh God, we pray. We want to pray for them. We want to pray your blessing upon them. And we pray for our land, for our nation, for our community, and all oh, that you would help us in these days, O oh God, that we would feel the, the, the great dilemma, the great trouble that we're in, and all oh, that men may realize that they need to seek after God. Mm. We pray for our sister congregations, that you would bless them each and every one. We pray for the work of the gospel to the far ends of the earth. We pray especially for Christians who are persecuted this morning, Christians who find themselves in trouble through uh, financial uh, circumstances, through um, the, 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 the weather that faces them and perhaps um, that they find themselves, oh God, in, in difficult days. Remember them and cause your face, we pray, oh God, to shine upon them. And we pray that we, all of us, may rest in the God who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory. Keep us in that place of resting on you, of trusting you day by day, we pray. Cleanse us from our many, many sins. Be with us right through the day. Make it a good day for the kingdom of God. Make it a good day for, for our hearts, we pray. Our prayers are asked in Jesus' name. He who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, good to see you there this morning. Good to be together. And um, in terms of announcements, well, the evening service at six o'clock, we hope you can be there to join us for that. And we look forward to meeting in the presence of God. We'll be in church as usual. The prayer meeting, well, hopefully we are going to have prayer meeting upstairs on Tuesday evening. All the signs are good for that, and that ought to be the case. Um, if you want to come, that's dead on and we'll love to see you if you're not able to come or you don't feel comfortable about coming um, we will be online it'll be exactly the same prayer meeting the bible study will run on youtube and on facebook as normal then the prayer meeting will follow on skype and we'll all be connected together hopefully we'll hear you and you'll hear us we've done the experiments we've got it working there's one more test to go just to be sure but that's what we're going to be doing on tuesday evening at eight o'clock Children's meeting, this would be good to pray for this. Children's meeting, hoping to go online this week on Friday evening. Some more experiments. It's going to be a busy week of experiments, this, but that's going to be on Friday evening at 7. So pray for them. Sunday school, of course, already doing their lessons in a slightly different way, but this is going to be live um, on uh, Friday evening. So pr pray for that and 
We pray that all goes uh, well and smoothly. Then we'll be back on the Lord's Day morning and evening. And as you may, I'm sure, have heard, we're hoping to have the Lord's Supper there on Sunday evening. It'll be in church. All the elements will be um, separate. Um, so we don't believe that there are any risks being taken there. It will look slightly different, but we can cope with that, I think. And uh, we'll look forward to being able to meet around the Lord's table. So I think that's all the announcements. I've dealt already with some um, private and personal information. We'll read from a psalm. It's Psalm 119. It's a part that we often sing from verse 33 and on, section 5 of Psalm 119. Teach me to follow your decrees, then I will keep them to the end. Give insight, and I'll keep your law with all my heart to it attend. Lead me in your commandments' path, for there, O Lord, delight I find. Incline my heart towards your laws, from selfish gain preserve my mind. O turn my eyes from worthless things, give life according to your word. To me, your servant, keep your pledge, so that you may be feared, O Lord. Remove me, sorry, remove from me the shame I dread. Your laws excel in uprightness. O how I long for your decrees. Preserve me in your righteousness. And there's a psalm writer, and he loves God's law, but he's anxious to, to walk in God's law. He doesn't want to say, I um, you know, love God's law, but he doesn't really in practice. He wants practice and what he says to match, doesn't he? And that's where we ought to be too. Well, we come back then this morning to the book of Titus. Paul is writing to Titus. Titus um, would appear to be a younger minister. He is certainly in Crete. He's been left to minister to the church there. He's got a difficult task on. Um, he's got to deal with all sorts of people, older people, younger people, people who are slaves. And his task in life, the task that Paul is leaving him with, is to bring God's word. He's to do it um, without favor. He's to do it without fear. That's no small task. But that's what he's to do, without favour and without fear. So Paul tells him, you're going to have to speak to the older men, and you're going to have to tell them some very uncomfortable things. You're going to have to speak to the older women, and you're going to have to say things to the older women that they're not going to be too pleased about. You're going to have to confront younger men. You're going to have to speak to servants whose lives are very difficult, but you're going to have to tell them things that probably they won't like you telling them. But this was what Titus was being called to. That's the work of gospel ministry, not pandering to people, but telling people what God has to say. And that's what Titus is to do. And as we come then into chapter 3, we've noticed that Titus is to remind the Christians in Crete about the nature of the gospel. He's to remind them of where they were and what a mess their lives had been in. He's to remind them of what God had done for them. And last Sunday morning, we came on to that theme of the new birth. And we talked about the new birth. God, we said, has intervened in the new birth. God has brought about a washing in our hearts. God is in the business of renewing our hearts by his Holy Spirit. And I want this morning to think about God the Holy Spirit and what he does in our hearts. And um, if I read verse 5 and 6, you'll see where I'm coming from, from. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. That's not the gospel. If you think the gospel this morning is that we love God and somehow we manage to climb the ladder, somehow by our good works we manage to get into God's favor, you haven't understood the gospel. 
Because the gospel comes to people who are afar off, who don't love God, who don't know God. But it reaches down to them in their misery. And because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, it lifts them up, you see. That's the gospel. It's good news. It's good news. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration. That's that word, to be born again, that idea of being born again. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing, that's the ongoing renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And Paul is putting a bit of emphasis here on God the Holy Spirit, and so we're going to observe that emphasis this morning. I'm going to spend a little bit of time thinking about God the Holy Spirit in our lives. And here we go, folks. Wait for it. Five headings this morning, okay? But they won't be so long. So five headings this morning. The Holy Spirit's presence, the Holy Spirit's pouring, the Holy Spirit's person, the Holy Spirit's power, the Holy Spirit's priority. The Holy Spirit's presence. What Paul is telling us is that in the life of a Christian, God the Holy Spirit is present. He's come and he stays. The Holy Spirit's pouring. What Paul is telling us is that when God gives us his Spirit, he pours him out. This isn't a drop here and a drop there. He pours him out. The Holy Spirit's person, what Paul is telling us, is that when God the Spirit comes, he's not an it. He's a person who stays in our heart. God the Spirit's power. What Paul is telling us is that God has poured out his Holy Spirit who is a very powerful person indeed and who can change our lives no matter what they look like. God the Spirit's priority. And Paul is telling us that his priority, of course, is to make us like Jesus. That's what he's about. He wants to make us like Jesus. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit's presence to begin with. Now, we made mention there last week of God the Holy Spirit and what has happened to the Christian. He's the bringer or the applier of the new birth. And Paul talks about the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. We noticed last Sunday morning um, those words of the Lord Jesus to um, that man, you remember, Nicodemus. Nicodemus had come to Jesus by night. He is a ruler of the Jews. He wants to understand what Jesus is talking about. He doesn't want his friends knowing that he's coming. Jesus says, you need to be born again. And that's true for every single one of us in this room this morning. We need to be born again. We need God the Spirit to burst into our lives. We need God the Spirit to come. Don't marvel, says the Lord Jesus to Nicodemus, that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it. You can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. We all of us need this secret working of God the Holy Spirit. And so think about it. It's God the Son who purchases salvation for us by his perfect life and by dying for us on the cross to be raised on that third day. It's God the Spirit who picks up all that Jesus has done and brings it to us and he makes it ours in time, in life. He brings the new birth. He rebirths us and he comes to stay. He comes to stay in our lives. Now we need to think about that, the Holy Spirit's presence. He comes to stay. He doesn't come to, you know, that he might come and go, that he might flit, that he might 
leave us. I know that in Psalm 51, very famously, David, of course, was to pray um, following his sin with Bathsheba and in contrition over that sin something of a year later. He says, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. I know that David prayed that prayer. It's not at all surprising that he prayed that prayer because you remember that David followed Saul. Now, there are passages, I'm not going to go through it all there this morning, but there are passages in 1 Samuel that clearly indicate that God the Spirit came on Saul. But the thing about Saul is that Saul was never truly the Lord's. God the Spirit came on him and did things in him and through him. But Saul never truly the Lord's. He never really had a heart for God. There's a difference between Saul and David. David was a man after God's own heart, you see. God the Spirit was in him. When God the Spirit comes into our lives, he gives us a heart, a new heart. A heart after God's own heart. Saul didn't have that. Saul didn't have that. So let's not get confused there this morning. When God the Spirit comes into the life of a Christian, he comes to stay. He comes to stay. He's a welcome visitor. He's not an unwelcome visitor in the sense that, you know, um, whoever it is has come and we're hoping that they're going to go quite quickly. You know, no. He's a welcome visitor and he comes to stay. And he comes to make changes in our lives. Now, it is possible to grieve the Spirit. That is true. So we read there in the book of Ephesians, if I can turn this one up um, quickly enough, and in uh, chapter 4, we do read in verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We will talk about him being a person in a moment, but it's possible to grieve the Spirit. That's true. It's clear from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, I think it is, that we can quench the Spirit. But when God the Spirit comes, He comes to stay. He's got a job to do. He's got a soul to keep. Perhaps you're feeling somewhat low in your Christian life. It's a very testing time, isn't it? Very confusing time. And perhaps you, you do feel somewhat low. I want to remind you that God the Spirit has come into your heart. He wants to change your heart. He wants to make you like Jesus. He wants you to feel assured. He wants you to feel the comfort of God's love. He doesn't come and go in the sense that he flits and he says, Look, I've had enough. No. He comes to stay. Having said that, you and I need to be careful that we don't quench him, that we don't grieve him, that we're not careless with the things of God, that we're not wayward with the things of God, that we don't push the things of God out there. How can we expect to know the comfort that God the Spirit brings if we're going to be careless with the things of God? We can't. We can't. But don't think that he lets us down, because he doesn't. He comes, and he comes to stay the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. Remember that Titus was writing to people, or going to address people. Paul's writing to Titus. That's what I'm trying to say, I suppose. And Titus is going to be speaking to people on the back of that who were pretty difficult. There were some pretty difficult characters here. But God, the Spirit, was present in their hearts, he was present. He doesn't just give up, you know. He comes to stay. The Holy Spirit's presence. The Holy Spirit's pouring. Pouring. We're told that he was 
poured out on us abundantly. He was plentifully poured. And there are truths here that we really need to think about. For in the Christian world, there is great confusion. Great confusion. But when God the Spirit comes in conversion, he's poured out. This word is used in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 17. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilt. That's the word there. To be spilt out, to, be, to go all over the place. What a mess. But there's not a mess here. He's poured out. Revelation chapter 16, there's reference there to the angels pouring out their bowls. Same word. It's used a number of times in Revelation chapter 16. This is to pour. It's not a drop. Not a drop. You know, it's not a drop. He's poured out. This isn't a dribble. He's poured out. The commentator, he puts it like this. He says, God the Father not only gives his Son, but also pours out his Spirit. God the Spirit has been poured into your heart, if you're a Christian there this morning. And I want to draw out the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And this isn't an easy um, subject to touch upon, and perhaps less easy on a Sunday morning when we've not quite so much time to look into the detail. But this word is used in the book of Acts um, for what happens on the day of Pentecost, when God the Spirit is poured on the New Testament church. And so we read in Acts in chapter 2 and verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, Let this word be known to you, and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and he quotes from the Old Testament. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. And there is some kind of a difference between the Old Testament here and the New Testament in the sense that God the Spirit is poured. Now, conversion always required the work of God, the Holy Spirit. Think back to that passage. I think we read it last week, didn't we, in, in John and chapter um, Three, when Jesus is speaking there to Nicodemus. And do you remember what Jesus said to him in verse 10? Nicodemus said, how can these things be? So Jesus is telling him about the new birth. And Nicodemus, who's a ruler amongst the Jews, he doesn't understand. How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you a teacher of Israel and do not know these things? He should have known about these things. Because the new birth always was. Don't get confused there. Don't think that somehow the new birth only belongs to the New Testament. You've gone way out of order if you think that. We've always needed the new birth. Nicodemus ought to have known that. But with the departure of our Lord Jesus Christ into heaven, there's a sending forth of God the Holy Spirit that in some way or other is greater than in the Old Testament. He's poured out. Now, in what way? Well, you know, in the Old Testament, the people were largely taught through things that they saw, so the temple taught them that God was in their midst. The sacrifices told them that they needed to come to God by means of a sacrifice. Those many Old Testament laws, which were rather finickety, told them that almost whatever they did, they fell into sin. They were taught through those things. 
But when we come into the New Testament, God's word, God's gospel goes to all the nations. Did you notice that as I read it from Joel? You see, he goes to all the nations. And with his going to all the nations, it's God the Spirit who comes to do something not just locally, the temple, the sacrifices, the priests. He goes to all the nations. And he brings us God's truth, not through the picture language of the Old Testament, but through the book that tells us of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, I want to apply that to us this morning. You see how privileged you and I are. We've got God, the Holy Spirit, who's been poured into our hearts to teach us. We haven't got a temple. We don't have any priests. We don't make sacrifices. All those pictures have gone. But we've got the fullness of God's word. And God the Holy Spirit has been poured out into our hearts. And he comes to teach us. And to teach us. And to teach us. And to teach us. Children, parents may quibble about their teachers and say, oh, can't teach. You see those teachers? Can't teach, they make. Sorry, teachers. But say, oh, the Disaster. We can't say that about God the Holy Spirit, can we? No, we can't. No, we can't. You see, if there's an obstruction, the obstruction is in our hearts. That's where the obstruction is. God has given us his word. Are we saying it's less than perfect? I hope not. God has given us his spirit. Are we saying that he's less than able? I hope not. No, if there's an obstruction, it's in our hearts. God, the Spirit's presence. God, the Spirit's pouring. God, the Spirit's person. He's the other comforter. He's the other counselor. He's amazingly powerful. He's God. He's a person. He's a person. We need to be careful about that. Of course, he's fantastic power, and we'll speak of that in a moment, but he's not an influence. He's a person. Now, I know that if you're using the authorized version, you will sometimes find in the pages of the authorized version that he's referred to there as an it. There's a simple reason for that. The the word for spirit in um, Greek is in the neuter. It's neither masculine nor feminine. But you know when the Lord Jesus speaks of God the Holy Spirit, he speaks of him as a he. He's a person. He's a person. We have a person in residence. Not an it. Not an influence. We have a person in residence. Let me tell you something else about this person. This person, God the Holy Spirit, is in perfect harmony with God the Father and God the Son. Now, you know, I have two sons, and I'd like to think that we're almost, you know, we're always in harmony, but, you know, realistically speaking, however hard we may try to get on and however much we may love each other, that's probably not always going to be the case, isn't it? There's probably going to be, you know, difficult moments in any human relationship, no matter how close that human relationship be. But that's not the case between the persons of the Godhead. They never argue. They never see things differently. There's never a contention. They've never got different ideas. 
It never comes to you go your way and I'll go mine. No, there are no breakups within the persons of the God head. And his working in our hearts, you see, isn't a matter of sheer power. It's his gentle, tender longing within us. We're going to sing that hymn at the end. It'll come up in a minute. It's a beautiful hymn. 289. But it's a beautiful hymn. And it will speak of God the Spirit in his gentle and tender and gracious dealings with us. I want you to realize this morning a person has come to live in your heart and he's been poured out. He's constantly present. But he's a person. He's striving within your heart. And he longs for you. The Holy Spirit's presence, the Holy Spirit's pouring, the Holy Spirit's person. But fourthly, the Holy Spirit's power, his power. Now, of course, all sorts of things get said when it comes to talking about the power of God, the Holy Spirit. There's no question that our Lord Jesus Christ did uh, many, many intensely powerful miracles in his life. He turned water into wine for a start off. He stilled the storm. He gave the blind their sight. I don't quite know why, but at the moment with one little ones, we're, uh, we're in the garden now, of course, but we're in the garden and we want to play being a blind man. You know, children, they do these different things, don't you? We seem to walk around with a stick and I have to come to the assistance of this blind man. But Jesus gave the blind their sight. He gave the deaf their hearing. He fed the 5,000 from a few little loaves of bread and some fish and even raised the dead. His apostles followed on and God gave them to do miracles which demonstrated who they were and their power and might and so on. Paul writes, doesn't he, to the church at Corinth in chapter 12 of um, 2 Corinthians and uh, verse 12. You think about this verse. You've got time this afternoon. You stop and think about this verse. And it says there, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12, truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. People haven't thought that verse through. They haven't thought that verse through. These mighty deeds were done, but what was the point of them? Well, they pointed to the Lord Jesus as God's anointed. They pointed to the apostles as Christ's anointed. But they pointed to the redeeming and reconciling work brought about in a person being born again, in a person being brought from death to life, in a person being brought from the total dominance and power of sin in their lives and being free to serve God. And so here's the blind man and now he can see. That's the new birth, isn't it? Here's the deaf man, he can't hear God. But now he can see. Here's the hungry. But now they're fed. Here's the lame, but now they can walk. The point of those miracles is to demonstrate, you see, the wonderful truth of the new birth. Yes, they pointed to the Lord Jesus. They pointed to the apostles. But ultimately, the message was, this is what the new birth does. The Lord Jesus can overturn the effects of the fall. So the fall brought death. The fall brought blindness. The fall brought deafness. The fall brought hunger. All brought a weather system that is topsy-turvy. Whereas the weather in the Garden of Eden was beautiful. And always beautiful. But the Lord Jesus overturned all of that in those miracles. 
They demonstrate the Spirit's power. The Spirit can change your life and my life. He can change us around. And I want to emphasize that because as I listen and watch on, it often seems that when people speak or think of God the Holy Spirit, they're taken with ideas of miracles and great demonstrations of power. Indeed, there are whole movements of people that follow ideas like that. But they're missing the point. The point is that those things show the power of God to change lives and to reverse the fall and to bring us back into a place where once more we can walk with God, where once more we can love God. Where once more we can serve God. The real message is that sin is dealt with. And that's the very thing that we need, isn't it? Sin dealt with. Sin dealt with by the cross. Our sins are laid on him. But sin dealt with in our hearts. Because even if we're forgiven, we still need the power of sin in our hearts to be broken. And that's what God the Spirit does. The washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's presence, the Holy Spirit's pouring, the Holy Spirit's person, the Holy Spirit's power, the Holy Spirit's priority. What is the great priority of God the Holy Spirit? It's for holiness. We said it last week, I'll say it again. It's for holiness. It's to make us like Jesus. It's to make us like God's Son. Is to bring us to a place where we cry out, take away the love of sinning, Alpha and Omega B. Where we purposely desire and long to love God and for God to be number one in our hearts and in our lives. Remember the prayer of the Lord Jesus in that high priestly prayer in John and chapter 17. It's there at verse um, 17. And he prays, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. What was the Lord Jesus praying for? Just very briefly before he went to his cross. In regard to his disciples, sanctify them through your truth. The Holy Spirit is concerned to make us like Jesus. He wants to make us like Jesus. The commentator, he puts it, the Spirit's action lies behind our hatred of sin, our hunger and thirst for righteousness, and our struggle against the defects of our own personalities. The Spirit's action lies behind our hatred of sin, our hunger and thirst for righteousness, and our struggle against the defects of our own personalities. God the Spirit is about bringing the fruit of the Spirit into our lives. God the Spirit is about making us holy. He's about making us like Jesus. Why is Paul making so much emphasis here about God the Holy Spirit being poured into our lives? Because those are the very characteristics that he is so set on seeing in the church in Crete. There were some nasty characteristics in the church in Crete. And these things were not nice things. And he wants the Christians in Crete to know that their lives were to be changed so that they produced the fruit of the Spirit, so that they produced those good works that he keeps going on about in his writing here in this book. Why is he talking so much about God the Holy Spirit? 
because you see it's God the Holy Spirit who breaks in and it's God the Holy Spirit who stays and he's set on making you and I like Jesus. Dear friend, you and I need God the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need to be born again. We need the new birth. We need God the Holy Spirit poured into our lives. We need to be saved. We need to be rescued from sin. We can't make those changes in our lives, in our own strength. We can't bring that about. The Christian gospel isn't that we climb a ladder and somehow we make it to heaven. No, the Christian gospel is that God reaches down on the basis of what he's done in his son and breaks into our lives in his spirit and changes us and remakes us and brings to us the new birth and points us to Jesus and goes on then to bring about those changes in our lives that we could never bring about. You need to be born again. Have you been born again? You need to be honest with yourself there this morning. Have you been born again? Been born again. Someone asked me to do my testimony. It's gone all over the place. You may have seen it. I don't know. But before I became a Christian, I thought I was a Christian. And I wasn't. Until God, the Holy Spirit, broke in. That's what we all of us need. We need God, the Holy Spirit, to break in. We do. And how careful, if you are a Christian there this morning, to remember his power, his might, his person, and so on. He's come to stay. He's come to change. Be careful not to grieve him. You can. You can. Be careful not to quench him. You can. Let's be careful to walk in step with God the Spirit. Well, I'm going to sing that um, lovely hymn of which I spoke a moment or two um, ago. 289. It's only me that needs to look it up these days, but 289. Our blessed Redeemer, ere he breathed his tender last farewell. A guide, a comforter bequeathed with us to dwell. 289. Oh, 
Gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son into the world to be our Saviour, for all that he did and accomplished for us. And we thank you that with our Lord Jesus returning to glory and at your right hand, you poured forth your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you poured him into lives here this morning. We pray, O oh God, pour him into every life that we all of us may know the Saviour, that we all of us may be in love with him, that we all of us, O oh God, may know the wonder of salvation. And where he's come to live, to dwell, O oh God, change us, we pray, from glory to glory, as unto the image of the Lord. Change us from day to day, from week to week, from year to year. Mould us and make us like the Lord Jesus that we may honour him and glorify him in our lives. Our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 